Okay. Welcome back everyone to ECE 590. Um, today we have two presentations. Um, starting us off is Thanathipan Balakandran. Thanathipan is a PhD student working with Professor Haran. He is working on NASA's liquid hydrogen fuel cell electric aircraft effort focused on lowering risks in superconducting motors for electric aircraft propulsion. He also works on a 10 megawatt fully superconducting wind turbine generator for NSF to create and mitigate AC losses. His research interests include electrical machines and drives, electric propulsion, and superconducting machines. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Max, for my central action. I uh, hope everybody, everybody can hear me. Yep, yeah, we can hear you. OK. So today I'm going to present about the feasibility study on superconducting motor topologies for a hydrogen-powered all-electric commercial aircraft. This is uh, what uh, like a um, group of uh, us working on. It's called Cheetah Project, and I will go over it uh, in a couple of slides. So uh, before I uh, before I start on the project, I would like to first uh, uh, focus on why uh, why we be looking at the electrical aircraft. There's a two main reason for uh, the interest in electrical aircraft. One is the economic reason. The other one is the carbon emission reason. So in economic, like uh, aviation industry uh, is uh, like in 1.3 trillion total US economic activity. Um, and uh, the next reason is that, um, that the fuel prices are going high every year. For example, in 2001, 13 percentage of the total operating cost went for fuel, but in 2019, it was like 23.7. Um, so it's, it's expected that the, the fuel cost will continues to rise. Uh, so that's why um, um, it, it's, uh, the, the industry is trying to move towards uh, electrical aircraft. The second reason is the carbon emission. The two percent of the, or two percent of the total world carbon emission is coming from the um, aviation. Uh, and also it is, um, uh, is like 12 percent of that all transport emission. So this graph shows that if, if we don't any take action, then how much CO2 emission will end up. And if you take action, how, which, how much we can reduce it. So like the Cheetah is targeting to developing the enabling technologies for commercial electric aircraft. Uh, so that is the target of this project. So uh, what is Cheetah? Cheetah is a acronym for Center for High Efficiency Electrical Technologies for Aircraft. It is centered in uh, uh, UIUC. And there are a lot of partners uh, in, this, um, uh, in this effort, including Boeing and MIT, uh, and uh, Ohio State University and like uh, plenty of other partners. So what we are doing, we are taking a 737 um, uh, or 800 like Boeing airplane and we are trying to convert it to uh, um, a hydrogen powered like fuel cell uh, electric aircraft. So, uh, so you can see that uh, um, an artistic drawing of an um, uh, cheetah aircraft compared to a Boeing 737. So the difference of this shape, and you will see that why this is these uh, airplanes look different in the next slide. So like we are trying to target uh, all these um, uh, all these like 737 capabilities, but with the Cheetah, what we are trying to achieve is that uh, we are going to uh, reduce the CO2 and NO, uh, NOx emission to the zero. Uh, so and also we will in increase the efficiency of the electrical aircraft. So, um, so why the why that uh, the, the aircraft looks different than the 737? Because we we wanted to have this uh, liquid hydrogen uh, in the airplane. So you see that the blue uh, circles; those are like liquid hydrogen tanks. Uh, they were on top of the uh, the ceiling of the uh, the aircraft. Um, and then we also have the fuel cells and battery uh, in the in the electric aircraft. This is like high level um, the electrical system diagram, and you can see that. So the fuel cells uh, will generate power. And then from that point, so what we are going to do is that we are going to use some, um, some cryogenic environment to uh, trans the transmit the power to the mortars. So we were, uh, we were looking, looking at ways to efficiently, efficiently control the, uh, this power system. Uh, like we want to reduce the ohmic losses in the system. So that's why we were like exploring like superconducting motor technologies and like superconducting cables. 
so that's uh, what we're looking at. So what we what is happening here is that we have a fuel cells and then we connect it to a bus bar and it's going to the wings and we are the wings which have uh, the inverters and the uh, and the motor. So they were like integrated system. And also the battery is located close to the wing. As you can see that in this diagram, the yellow one is the wing, the yellow one is the battery. So why we have batteries for like to uh, give more power in the takeoff and also save the energy when we were uh, in the cruise condition. Um, so why why we are going to after um, why we are going after hydrogen um, liquid hydrogen because uh, there's a one reason is that the batteries are heavy um, and then um, so therefore like if you use hydrogen and then we can extend the uh, the range of the um, aircraft and also we can look for a like commercial uh, like um, commercial uh, electric commercial electric aircraft which has like we can transport um, uh, a lot of passengers. Um, and when you use liquid hydrogen, what is the additional advantage coming uh, coming to us is that we can use this liquid hydrogen to cool the uh, electrical uh, system like um, cables and conductors and uh, cable conductors, motors and inverters. So which um, which will give us an opportunity to uh, explore like superconducting technologies because when we use superconductors in uh, like uh, cables, like we can reduce the weight by significantly. Um, and then also we can reduce the like ohmic losses. So that's the reason we were looking at um, this um, liquid hydrogen and then uh, leverage this, um, uh, this capability of the liquid hydrogen to cool the uh, electrical system. So this is the like um, uh, a simplified diagram of how this works. So we have the liquid tanks and then go to uh, the motor. So we will cool the motor. So we assume that we can use a fully superconducting motor, and then also we can use to uh, we can use the cable to cool because we can have like superconducting cable to transmit the power, and also we will cool the power converters. Uh, then um, then after that we will send the um, uh, liquid hydrogen to like the gas hydrogen to fuel cells. Uh, so, because the fuel cells need uh, gas hydrogen with a higher temperature, so like almost ambient temperature, uh, but we store the hydrogen in the liquid, uh, uh, liquid state. So that's, uh, that's the uh, idea. So now I would like to point out that like this is a NASA roadmap, NASA roadmap of achieving like high power density and high efficiency motors. So as you can see that, so uh, with, with non cryogenic like conventional um, a system like the NASA motor that's we have like 13 point kilowatt per kilogram that's what we were uh, what we designed at UIUC and we are yet to uh, do um, experimental demonstration but like NASA proposing like we can go up to uh, push uh, push the limits up to like 19.7 kilowatt per kilogram but if we want to like double the uh, if we want to like uh, double the um, uh, uh, if you want to double the um, uh, the parameters, what we need, what you need to use is we need to go for a, a, first, a cryogenic or superconducting technology. You can see that from non-cryogenic to cryogenic, we can almost double uh, double the um, parameters, like the efficiency and also the power density. So it's also we can uh, using that you can see that the two time or five times in uh, increase in power density we can achieve with uh, uh, superconducting technologies. If you in the system level, if you include like the copper weights in the cables and everything. So now I will uh, go uh, go a little deep into the machine sizing. So how we are going to, how we are doing the machine sizing. So uh, for a 737 aircraft, we know the total energy and then we know the proper ship power. So we assume that we are going to fly this aircraft for eight, eight hours. From that, uh, we, and then we, we, first we assume that we are going to use 16 propeller uh, for the aircraft. So it will, the each motor will have 2.5 megawatt. And we assume that a typical speed of the jet engine like 4,500 RPM. So, and then if you look at the, um, the overall, the, uh, the, uh, the energy consumption of the fuel cells, and we see that like when we take over, we will use most of the liquid hydrogen, but in the cruise condition, we will use less hydrogen and then it just goes like that. So we, uh, we plan to use that we, we, we allocate the cooling capacity of the motor to be to be the cruise condition. So that's what, so we can use only like 4.32 kilowatt of the cooling capacity. So 
um, how do we come up with the number? Because we, we are going to let the uh, liquid hydrogen to go through the motors to pull the, cool down the motor. So we assume that we will send 70% of the, uh, the liquid hydrogen used in the fuel cell to go through the motor, to cool the motor. So that's came up like 4.32 kilowatt of the cooling power, the enthalpy that we can get from the liquid hydrogen. So we need to, so um, this came up, came to us that we need to design the motor that uh, the total losses on the motor should be less than 4.32 kilowatt. To design the motor, first we started with uh, uh, to the, the propeller and the motor core design study. So we would like to see that how much, uh, how much the larger the diameter of the motor we should go for. So first we studied that here that, so we, uh, we integrate the motor and the um, uh, motor and the um, propeller and then we studied the efficiency and the motor weight. And so it's as we found out that up to like, when we go up to around like uh, 0 0.25 meter diameter, so we can design the, the fully, superconducting, so fully superconducting motor like less than 30 kilogram. So with that information, and also we studied that what happens when we go for a very small motors, but for example, um, for example, if we can increase the number of propellers, so like for example, 32 or 32, this year we have 16, what will happen is that the diameter of the motor will go further small. So we also analyzed that. So what we found out that when we make the diameter so small, what happens is the axial length will go high and also the losses would go high. So it's all come to, we came to a conclusion that to um, uh, get, the, uh, get the motor working and then the, to limit the losses up, uh, under the three kilowatt. Uh, so the diameter is around 2 point, uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.5 meter diameter. That's the, the maximum OD that we can, uh, the minimum OD we can go for. So with that in mind, we, get, we go ahead and then we optimize the motor and then we, we study like different pole pair all pair of the motors because um, these the fully superconducting motors are sensitive to the operating frequency. So if we go for a higher frequency, the losses would go high, and we will um, uh, we will go beyond the uh, the loss cap capability that we have, we, we could control in our machine. So we studied that from like different pole count of the machine, and we found out that like if we go with an eight pole machine, we can get a lower weight, uh, like um, like around uh, lower weight and like the losses is less than like uh, like three kilowatts. So that's the design we choose for uh, this uh, this um, uh, this study. So uh, then we further optimize the eight pole design and we show that with that one, so the active weight we can achieve like 26 kilogram and then the total loss was around 2000, uh, like 3000, um, uh, 2375 watt design can be achieved uh, with 26 kilogram of weight. So it's it's around like 96 kilowatt per kilogram, like it's only active weight. So it's a very significant power density machine. So from this study, uh, we also learned that, so for a fully superconducting machine, it's like uh, though we have the capability to, to push the field very large, but that's not going to happen because when we push the Loss, uh, feel very large, the losses increases in the armature conductor. So because, so we are restricted by the losses in the armature conductor. So what we show is that we can only go for like between 0 0.4 Tesla and 0 0.6 Tesla of the uh, field in the air gap field. Because if we go beyond that, what happens is the total losses in the machines goes higher. So what we are doing is that we are increasing the electrical loading and we are reducing the magnetic loading in the fully superconducting machine. Um, so what we are seeing is that when we go for a low uh, flux density design, I mean, very low flux density design, then what happens is the weight goes high. If we go to higher flux density, flux density design, uh, design, what happens is that we have, a, uh, we have a low weight design, but their losses goes high. So this uh, came uh, like from the study, we also found out that, so if, if we are only going for a, like 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 Tesla, so we can achieve this flux density with like permanent magnets. We don't need uh, uh, field coils, like superconducting field coil to generate this, uh, um, this, um, this air gap flux density. So what we, so then what we studied the next one is that we put a permanent magnet to generate that flux density and we use the fully superconducting armature coils to, for the fully superconducting armature coils. Um, to generate that, that much of field, we need around 15 millimeter thickness magnets and then we use the Hallback array magnet so there are two 
the, um, the one of the other parameters we checked is the demagnetization. So because now we are pushing too much current through the armature coil. So is that going to affect the, if it's going to induce any demagnetization on the magnet? So from the study, what we found out is that uh, we can, uh, yes, we can, we can design the motor with, uh, um, uh, with permanent magnet, but the permanent magnets are heavy compared to um, uh, the field coil. So, so he, I see this comparison here, see for that fully superconducting machine with additional weights, including the additional supporting structure and everything, we'll end up around like 88 kilogram, but uh, for a permanent magnets, like it, it will double the weight. So uh, the power density will go by half. And also, but um, and also, I analyzed that the mm, uh, the demagnetization effect, but the demagnetization effect is not that high. For example, if I assume like 0 0.1 Tesla knee point, then the operating condition, uh, like normal operating condition, like demagnetization is less than one percentage. This color coding shows that we have the demagnetization will happen. And also, I analyzed in the like short circuit condition, and it is go only like two percentage. So like. After that, we also analyzed that, um, like we because we have the um, uh, like the cooling capacity, we can use like clear cooled aluminum conductor. So which uh, like if you use a multi-filament high purity aluminum conductor. So what is the advantage is that at like 20 Kelvin, so they are uh, their resistivity go by like 400 times less than what we in 20 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, so, but what is the advantage of using uh, uh, this aluminum conductor because uh, if you use the aluminum conductor, there's no quench because in fully superconducting machine, if you use the superconductor, uh, when they, if you increase the temperature beyond the critical temperature, they will quench and then they will act as a normal conduct. At that time, uh, like the whole machine will like uh, end up like a thermal runaway situation, like the whole machine will fail. But with this aluminum conductor, so if you increase the temperature, what will happen is the resistivity will go like accordingly. So with that, so we, we don't have, we will not end up quench, but we will increase the losses. So, uh, so then we analyze that what is the losses we would have in, uh, in an aluminum conductor. So we assume that the triple R mean like at like 20 Kelvin, uh, the resistivity will go by 400 times lower, it is 4.2. And we also will have the similar losses that we will have in the fully superconducting machine like AD current and the coupling losses. So with that, so I, we did a comparison and then I have the result here. So um, I used this poor filament aluminum conductor. So then, and then, so the resistivity losses is around 629 Watt. And we don't have the hysteresis losses that we will have in fully superconducting water, which we don't have it in aluminum conductor. And we have the eddy current losses and the coupling losses are same. And then we don't have the transport current losses which we'll have in fully superconducting machine, but we don't have it in clear for aluminum conductor. So when I compare these losses, the aluminum the critical aluminum conductor have less losses than uh, total losses. Or be, I mean, I will say like close enough, like 2,500 to like 3,300. I haven't got the, the actual data for the, um, the aluminum conductor to calculate the total armature conductor weight, but I, I, would ex I will expect to be less than what we will have in, uh, in the MGB2. So what is the conclusion? So uh, the fully superconducting machine design space, uh, like what we have is like around 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 Tesla. There's no, uh, there's no benefit of pushing the high flux density because we will increase the losses. And fully superconducting motors and cryo cool aluminum conductor motors seems promising. Um, losses in cryo cool aluminum conductor, pass, uh, uh, like partially superconducting motors are similar to what we will see in a fully superconducting motors. Uh, we also analyze the PM motors, but they are heavy. Um, but there's a one more challenge in, uh, uh, in uh, like the, the fully superconducting or in the aluminum cryocool conductor. So what we have is that we need to cool the rotor coils, which, uh, which is challenging because we need to transfer the liquid helium to the rotor, which is rotating. So in the future works, I am, uh, we are planning some risk reduction testing to reduce these uh, uh, few challenges. I will go like next three slides on then what we are planning to do. So. Uh, but we are going to do that for the, um, uh, to reduce the risk, we are going to design uh, the armature coil and we are going to energize it and we are going to test the losses on the armature coil to validate that we can have uh, like 
losses and we can operate them under uh, like high frequency and also at the external field. So that's the one thing that we are going to plan on uh, like next year. Next one is that we are testing whether we can uh, use a, a rotating like uh, off the cell uh, commercial cryocooler to use to cool the uh, the rotor coils because now if we use the liquid hydrogen what we need to do is we need to transfer the liquid here hydrogen to the rotating part which is uh, like mechanically challenge so what we are trying to do is that um, uh, we we already uh, we we are already uh, set up the experiment and uh, we we are building all the components and we are going to start the testing this semester so we we bought uh, of the cell cryocooler and then we are going to rotate it and then we would like to see whether this this cryocooler will um, can rotate up to like 4500 rpm and cool down the uh, the field coils the next one is that we are planning to do some ac loss measurement setup and then we try to measure the losses that we uh, that we estimated on the uh, on the armature coils so this is a future plan that we doesn't we didn't do any it's all in the conceptual design we haven't started anything uh, to do on this, but this is a uh, future plan. Thank you very much. Do you have any question? Deepan, was the uh, was the field coil on the the hyperconductor aluminum? Mm -hmm. Is that is that uh, superconducting still, or? I assumed it to be superconducting uh, on this design, uh, but um, uh, yeah, we can consider the aluminum conductor too. But um, in this uh, in this study, I assume they are um, uh, the MGB two conductors, and I assumed like uh, aluminum conductor only on the armature points. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? Uh, it doesn't seem like it. So thank you, Thiepen. Um Up next, we have Josh Feldman. Josh, are you here? Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, are you able to share your screen? Uh, yeah, one second. Okay, there we go. Okay, so up next is Josh Feldman. Uh, Josh Feldman is a second year graduate student pursuing his MS in electrical engineering. He graduated from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in May 2019 with a BS in mechanical engineering. He works under the Haran Research Group with a focus on thermal management and mechanical design of superconducting machines and offshore wind generators. Okay, hey, uh, thank you, Max, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Josh Feldman. My supervisor is Professor Pruba Heron. Um, and my presentation is on a cryogenic cooling system for a fully superconducting aircraft propulsion motor. So I'll begin by discussing the motivation for this project. Uh, as well as an overview of the machine that the cooling system is designed for. Uh, I'll then go into the um, concept for the cooling design. Uh, and then I'll discuss the analytical validation of the cooling design. I'll uh, describe the current design that we have. Then I'll discuss next steps and end with Q&A and discussion. Um, so Deepan talked about this um, in his presentation. Um, this project is for the same um, is for the same project, the Center for High Efficiency Electric Technologies for Aircraft, or CHEDA project, which is a NASA-funded collaboration between several research institutions to develop technologies for a hydrogen-powered, fully electric commercial airplane. Um, so this airplane uses liquid hydrogen energy storage 
with a fuel cell system to convert the um, stored energy in the liquid hydrogen to electricity to power the airplane. The airplane will be propelled using fully superconducting motors and the cold liquid hydrogen will have a double use as a coolant for those fully superconducting motors. And this is the focus of this presentation is using the liquid hydrogen as a coolant for those motors. Um, and one of the motivations behind using fully superconducting motors is the increased power density, which is important for a weight sensitive application such as aircraft. Um, so now here's a overview of the superconducting machine that we'll be cooling. The machine has a outer rotor design, um, meaning that the DC field coils um, and what we call shield coils are on the rotor and they are outside of the um, armature coils, which are on the stator. Um, the shield coils are um, DC superconducting coils that rotate along with the field coils in order to contain the strong magnetic field produced by the machine and um, reduce the need for a uh, thick, heavy uh, back iron. For our conductor, we'll be using low AC loss MGB2 superconductors manufactured by Hypertech and shown here in the bottom right corner of the screen. These conductors have a critical temperature of 39 Kelvin, which is the temperature um, at which they transition to um, superconducting. Um, however, this is at zero current density and zero magnetic field. Um, so ideally we would like the temperature to be uh, significantly lower than 39 Kelvin. Um, although these wires do have comparatively low AC losses when compared to other superconducting materials, um, at the frequency we are operating our machine at, um, the IC losses are significant and do require uh, and do require a um, significant cooling system to reduce them. Uh, the rotating field and shield windings have minimal losses. So the focus for this presentation will be the cooling system for the stationary armature windings. Um, however, um, cooling of the field and shield windings um, will be a focus of um, continued research on this project. So here's a um, very short overview of the, um, of the cooling scheme of the motor. Uh, as I said, the um, rotor, rotor will be on the outside and that is what will propel the propulsion fan. Uh, the stator will be on the inside and this is where um, uh, most of the heat load is. So um, single phase liquid hydrogen will enter the stator and um, it will partially boil off and then two phase liquid, two phase hydrogen will exit the machine. So this is the uh, cooling concept um, how he will be removed from those armature windings that will produce uh, the AC losses. So the coils will be attached to an aluminum coil former, which will also function as a heat sink. The heat produced by the armature coils will be conducted into the aluminum. And then the heat will be conducted from the aluminum into um, stainless steel pipes, which will contain liquid hydrogen. And as the liquid hydrogen absorbs the heat produced by the coils, it will partially boil off and form a two-phase fluid, which will be the outlet of the cooling system. So shown on the right is a end view of this system. So the stainless steel pipes will be embedded into the aluminum uh, at about 120 degrees. Um, and um, uh, stiecast will be used to bond the pipes to the aluminum. So um, here's a um, 3D computer model of the um, current cooling concept we have. So the inlet and outlet of the, um, of the single phase liquid hydrogen and the two phase um, and the two phase hydrogen, which will be the outlet, 
will occur through the same pipe, um, well, through the same access. Uh, it'll occur through a coaxial pipe. So the single phase cold liquid hydrogen will enter in through this smaller uh, inner pipe. And then the two phase hydrogen will exit through this uh, larger outer pipe. Um, so the hydrogen will uh, be distributed through a manifold at the end of this pipe um, uh, or a flow distributor, which will break up the flow into several smaller pipes. So shown here on the far left, we have, um, we have the cooling system with only one of these pipes shown. So the fluid enters one of these pipes. Uh, it's a helical pipe that is bonded to the um, aluminum coil former and uh, it absorbs the heat produced by the armature coils. So shown on the far left is with one pipe, shown second from the left is with six pipes, um, shown in the middle is with all the pipes and the aluminum coil former and shown as a three quarter section view um, which allows you to see both the pipes and the coil former. Second from the right is the cooling system with, uh, with armature coils bonded to the aluminum coil former. And shown on the right is the, <clears throat> is the completed end view of the armature cooling design. So here's a schematic. Um, uh, once again, explaining the design and also including the cooling um, the cooling scheme for the rotor coils. So the hydrogen will enter through this coaxial inlet outlet. It will be distributed through several uh, pipes using this flow distributor. Uh, it will absorb the heat generated by the armature windings and return as a two-phase fluid. For the rotating shield and field windings, uh, the cooling scheme is a um, another aluminum uh, another aluminum structure which will support the windings, and the heat will be conducted into this aluminum structure um, through the aluminum structure, and it will be conducted into the liquid hydrogen uh, by use of um, superconducting uh, bearings. Um, so the heat will conduct through the bearings into the hydrogen. Um, and there will be one bearing on this side and one bearing on this side. And again, the rotor is on the outside um, and that is what will spin the propeller. So to begin the um, project, a simple analytical validation was done using the um, known latent heat of vaporization of hydrogen, um, available fuel on board and total energy required um, for the plane. Uh, our group was able to calculate that there is enough liquid hydrogen on board to uh, remove the AC losses estimated um, by the motor. So to uh, validate the cooling design I presented, um, a, a 1D thermal equivalent circuit was constructed. Um, and this thermal equivalent circuit is analogous to an electrical circuit. Um, the resistance of the coil of the um, epoxy bonding the pipe to the aluminum uh, of the stainless steel pipes themselves and of the convection was taken into consideration in this thermal equivalent circuits. Um, so again, it can be treated like an electrical circuits where these resistances are the thermal resistances. Um, the temperature is analogous to the voltage and the losses produced by the coil, the thermal losses are analogous to uh, electrical current. And following is an explanation of how the thermal equivalent circuit was built. Um, and then the results of this thermal equivalent circuit analysis. So um, the first step of this was a uh, thermal model of the MGB2 wire we plan on using. Uh, so the hypertech model, the hypertech wire shown on the right uh, is about 15% uh, MGB2 
33% niobium uh, and the rest copper nickel uh, by volume. So we can represent the thermal conductivity of this wire uh, by the use of equivalent thermal circuits. So in the longitudinal direction, um, or you can also think of as the axial direction, the thermal circuits are in parallel. So we just, we construct a parallel thermal circuits using the known thermal resistances of MgB2, niobium, and copper nickel. Uh, in the transverse direction, or you could also think of as the, uh, as the radial direction, um, the thermal circuit uh, is constructed in parallel with the uh, MgB2 and niobium in series. Um, and this series combination in parallel with the uh, copper nickel. So using this, um, these thermal models, the longitudinal uh, thermal conductivity was estimated around 100 watts per meter Kelvin. And the transverse conductivity uh, was estimated around seven watts per meter Kelvin. Uh, so an analytic, um, a thermal model of the coil as a whole was also um, created. Um, so, in, um, so as I explained in the previous slide, the thermal model of the individual wires. In this slide, I explained the thermal model of the coil as a whole. So shown here on the right is a cross section of the armature coil, which will include 11 cables with 28 strands per cable. So in this, we're assuming that the coil has a fill factor of 50%, meaning 50% of the cross section is the wire. And we assume that the rest is filled by epoxy with a thermal conductivity of 2.5 watts per meter Kelvin. Uh, in the longitudinal direction, we again assume that the thermal circuit is in parallel. Um, so we model that as a parallel thermal circuit. Um, in the transverse direction, uh, or in the radial direction, uh, the thermal conductivity can be re represented by this, um, by this equation here. Um, and uh, this equation was shown to be uh, appropriate uh, in a paper uh, describing thermal modeling of, M of uh, superconducting windings. Uh, and in this equation, Vf is the volume fraction of each of these components, and K is the thermal conductivity. So using this, we can find the transverse thermal conductivity of the coil. Um, finally, we have to calculate the thermal resistance um, of the convection, uh, of the flow boiling convection into the liquid hydrogen. And so the convective heat transfer coefficient, um, which we'll denote as alpha, it can be approximated using the didis bolter correlation, which is shown here in the top, uh, which is shown here in the top equation. And then this, in this equation, the Nusselt number on the left and the Reynolds number and Prandtl number on the right are dimensionless uh, parameters that can be broken down into, um, that, that are compo uh, composed of uh, other parameters about the flow. So when we rearrange this equation, we can solve for the um, convec convective heat transfer coefficient as follows. So using this 1D thermal equivalent circuits, um, a analytical model was constructed um, and using inputs of number of pipes, diameter of pipes, and total mass flow rates. Um, the thermal uh, model produced outputs of the minimum temperature of the coil, uh, the maximum temperature of the coil, and the um, temperature drop between um, the minimum and maximum temperatures um, across the coil. Um, so uh, a very high temperature drop across the coil was found, um, which may mean that um, the epoxy inhibits heat transfer within the coil, so we may need a better epoxy or um, a more optimal cooling geometry. Um, and 
as you might note, the minimum temperature of the coil is very high. So, um, the, so I plan to revisit the um, calculation to um, check the calculation and see if uh, perhaps there was an order of magnitude um, error in the, in the model. So next steps, um, first to, to refine the 1D analytical thermal model to further uh, 3D CAD work on the um, computer model. Um, and also to model the field and shield conduction cooling concepts, um, which I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Um, so this uh, cooling concept um, is rotating conduction cooling um, using superconducting bearings. So for this, I have planned a risk, re risk reduction experiment where, um, where a heater is spun at a frequency similar to that um, of the motor that we plan to use. Um, and uh, the temperature drop across a superconducting bearing will be measured at around 20 Kelvin. And this will, um, this will determine whether or not um, rotating conduction cooling using superconducting bearings is a viable option for cooling the um, rotating field and shield coils. Um, so thank you for listening and I'd like to answer any questions um, or comments that people have. Thank you. Yours. Can you go to that the temperature uh, that the table you have, like minimum temperature? Why it is too large? Or is that why do you say like six hundred sixty-two Kelvin? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I need to revisit my model. I think there might be a. It. It doesn't seem. It doesn't seem right, so I think I'm going to revisit it and check for errors. But um, yeah, uh, because yeah, we were trying just, to yeah, this is the initial right. result. Okay, okay. Because when I'm trying to keep it at twenty Kelvin, right? Because this is look like yeah. I I don't think this is um, I don't think these numbers are correct. I'm going to revisit my, my model, but uh, yeah, th these are just the um, results that I have. Okay. Uh, ready for today. Any other questions? Okay, it doesn't seem like it will. Thank you, Josh, for your presentation. Um, I think this concludes today's uh, ECE 590. Uh, thank you everyone for turning out and I wanna thank Josh and Deepin again for presenting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. If our PECI committee can stick around or if you need to hop off for a couple minutes, uh, we will be